Good afternoon and welcome to this event hosted by the School of International Service at American University. I'm Christine Chin, Dean of the School, and I'm excited to introduce our guest and our moderator for, today, for today's discussion. Before I do that, however, I want to recognize some people who've made this event possible. This event is co-sponsored by AU's Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center. I'm very proud of our two-person team at the center, Malini Ranganathan, and Christine Platt and the work that they're doing. Today's event is made possible by the generosity of two SIS alumni, Matthew and Cynthia Warshaw. Matt and Cindy are members of my Dean's at Board of Advisors and they're dedicated partners in our commitment to diversity, inclusion and anti-racism. Ongoing challenges of systemic racism coupled by recent national tragedies inspired Matt and Cindy to convene scholars and experts through a four-part anti-racism lecture series. Thank you, Matt and Cindy, for empowering our community to learn, reflect, and act on the urgent need to dismantle racism. First, a little bit of business. This discussion will last for about an hour with a Q&A session towards the end of the event. If you would like to ask a question, please submit it through the Q&A function at any time at the bottom of your Zoom window. Answers to questions will not be typed into the Q&A function, but closed captions will include all responses. This webinar will be recorded and made available on the SIS YouTube channel afterward. Now, on to our esteemed guest and moderator. Ramon Cruz is the first Latinx president of the Sierra Club. America's oldest and largest environmental organization. He has more than 20 years of experience working at the intersection of sustainability, environmental policy, urban planning, energy, and climate change. He has worked in the public sector in his native Puerto Rico as the deputy director of the Environmental Quality Board, as well as commissioner of the Puerto Rico Energy Commission. Ramon has also been a consultant at the World Bank the Natural Resources Defense Council, the Greenhouse Gas Management Institute, and the German Agency for International Cooperation. Equally important, I might add, and proudly so, that Ramon is an alumnus of SIS. Ramon, we're so very pleased to welcome you home to your alma mater. We hope that there will be many opportunities in the future for us to host you in person in our building. Thank you so very much for taking time to be with us virtually today. Our moderator for today is David Vasquez. David and I served together most recently on the AU Faculty Equity Task Force. David is Professor of Literature and Critical Race, Gender and Culture Studies at the College of Arts and Sciences here at American. He teaches courses on comparative Latinx literature, comparative ethnic American literature, critical race theory, environmental justice, eco-criticism and 20th century US literature. David, thank you also for joining us today. I will now turn over the Zoom screen to Ramon, who will start the conversation. Thank you. All right. Hello. Um, well, I'm, I wasn't sure if David was coming in with me, but uh, thank you so much, um, Dean Chin, for uh, that kind introduction, uh, and um, and also to American University for uh, and to the School of International Service, uh, to the College of Arts and Sciences, and the Anti-Racist uh, Research and Policy Center. Um, you know, for the invitation. You know, that's a that's a great name. You know, so necessary in today's world. And uh, I wish that sooner rather than later, uh, that policy center uh, only be a history research center. But unfortunately, uh, that is where we are right now uh, as a society. And uh, voices like that are so necessary in uh, policy creation and decision making. And so I want to thank also the audience for tuning in. Uh, you know, as, um, as you said, I'm Ramon Cruz. I use pronouns see him, his. And I am greeting you all from uh, what is the unceded territory of the Canarsie people, otherwise known now as Brooklyn. 
um, New York and, uh, you know, the Canarsi were part of the Lenape people that were horribly forced by the U.S. government to migrate mostly to uh, all the way to uh, to Oklahoma. And so, uh, you know, crazy, crazy to, to think about that today. And yet when one see policies or disasters like the ones happening at the border or, or the separation of families, you know, and policies towards uh, countries in Central America, uh, one can understand how abominable uh, situations, uh, you know, how abominable, abominable situations like these still happen today, no? Um, and in any case, I, I'm, I'm originally from Boriken, which is the Taino name for the island of, uh, that we know now as Puerto Rico. Uh, and um, again, very happy to, to be here with you today. Uh, you know, it's, um, it's a humbling experience to, to talk to you. Um, and, uh, you know, I only wish that I could be there in person. Uh, you know, I can't believe it's over 20 years since I left AU and, uh, and remember going to, to these kind of lectures uh, or conversations or panels, uh, you know, sometimes because I wanted and, and was interested and many times because a professor told us, uh, you know, it was an obligation as part of, uh, of a course or something like that, you know, but in any case, uh, you know, little I knew that two decades later, I would be invited to one of these events. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, you know, I've been back a few times, uh, I think to visit. Uh, most of my trips to DC happen rather quickly and in, uh, in downtown area. Uh, but I can still remember, you know, arriving to, to AU in the summer and uh, how it looked, how it smelled, and then the diversity in Leonard Hall, for example, the international dorm where I lived, you know, and for a kid from, from Puerto Rico, it was a huge change and a big eye opener. And I, I really hope um, that soon the students now can go and have those experiences, um, you know, and I wish this would have uh, a, a, been one of those and happen in person and you know it's especially with now in the spring uh, you know AU is so beautiful and I chose to be outside uh, hopefully it's not there's not too many uh, background noise but uh, hopefully soon we will be able to to meet and gather no and uh, and you know but of course uh, these days health uh, comes first and I I really hope that everyone listening is safe and is healthy and that your loved ones are safe and are healthy and, uh, and of course, getting vaccinated, um, you know, and I look forward to this conversation, you know, these are, of course, interesting times in our nation and in the world and, uh, and the intersection of all these topics is as fascinating as and exciting, uh, you know, as they are alarming and, and sovereign and, and urgent, you know, I would say to the students, uh, you know, coming up uh, right now that you know, it is okay given these times to feel overwhelmed, you know, and you should definitely, you know, look for help and, and, and you know, but be sure that you're getting the skills and getting involved and, uh, you know, in so many issues because there is a lot to do. And unfortunately, um, uh, you know, we like this generation that, that came before you, you know, have not done a, a good job in leaving the world in a, in a better state and and of course i apologize for that but i think you know between the pandemic the climate crisis and the awakening on systemic racism especially after the brutal murder of george floyd uh, you know that uh, where the 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 trial is happening right now um you know i hope these three issues like you know uh, provides this uh, a great unfortunate trifecta if you will uh, you know, on where to build a, a better society. And I, I know many of you um, have the pressure to build a career and make money and sustain your families, especially those being, you know, first generation going to college. But, you know, remember always to, to give back to your communities, uh, that there's always something much bigger than ourselves and that it is important to contribute to. And, and regardless of where your careers um, may take you, you know, be aware of, of your privilege and, and that there is no such thing as a self-made person because all of us are here because of people we have relied on and in one way or another because of our privilege in, in one form or another and that doesn't entitle us to, to feel superior. 
than anybody else. But anyway, I'll I'll stop there to, uh, you know, uh, I'm starting to deviate from the from what brought us here. So let's start the the conversation with uh, with David. Uh, thank you so much, Ramon, for those um, thoughtful remarks. And um, I just want to remind everybody that uh, we hope that the conversation today will be free flowing and that we'll get lots of participation from the audience. So just a reminder to type any questions that you have into the Q&A function at any point during our conversation. And I'll then read through some of those questions during the formal Q&A period. Um, Ramon, before David, we... and before, I just wanted to know if there's by any chance too much background noise, I will, I can go inside or if everybody can hear me, okay. You sound good to me. So, okay, good. Um, so before we begin, I, I also want to do an acknowledgement that the AU campus sits on the unceded territory of the native Piscataway, Nakotchtank, or Anacostian peoples, and that indigenous people everywhere um, are some of the most dire and disproportionate, uh, experience some of the most dire and disproportionate threats on account of climate change. So I have a slate of questions that um, Ramon and I will talk about, and um, I'll just toss out a question and uh, Ramon and I will kind of have a free flowing conversation. And, um, and then we'll get to your questions from the audience as we kind of move along. So the first question I have today, Ramon, is um, I'm wondering if you might be able to talk a little bit about some of the specific environmental justice projects you worked on with communities of color either before taking your leadership role with the Sierra Club or after. And if you can point to a few takeaways that have informed your vision for the Sierra Club and how the club's actions might unfold over the next three to five years. Okay, well, thanks a lot, uh, David, for, for that question. Um, uh, well, you know, it depends how, how far you go in developing, you know, in, in uh, you know, tracing when, you know, I, I started working um, with, uh, with this community, you know, different communities, but, uh, you know, I guess, uh, you know, it, it depends on, you know, as far as you go in developing the sensibility to work with, uh, you know, with disadvantaged communities. And, you know, actually uh, as a student, uh, you know, of history uh, at AU, um, you know, I, I focused my thesis uh, on the racial discourse of the Puerto Rican, you know, uh, movement for independence. I did that with Alan Lickman, although, you know, one of my mentors, Eileen Finley, had a lot to do with that. And, uh, and I took many classes on, on race relations. And I think, you know, a highlight of my education, for example, at AU was a class on, on 20th century African-American culture with uh, Bernice Johnson Regan, who would arrive, you know, like to class and break out singing a, a Negro spiritual, you know, and, and her class also forced us to, to go to many neighborhoods in, in DC that of course are now 20 years later, you know, gentrified and, and almost disappearing, unfortunately. But, but you know, it's, it's part of that process of, of becoming sensitive, uh, you know, to, to that, uh, to working with, uh, with other people that may not have had, a, you know, the privileges and the opportunities that one had. And, uh, but once I chose, you know, to focus on environmentalism as a career, then I tried to have experience that helped me develop myself, you know, further into the field. And I remember speaking with the then uh, Dean Louis Goodman uh, that, uh, that, you know, and I told him my thinking and, uh, and he put me in touch with his network, you know, uh, and, and one organization in, in Brazil, the Escal Group Foundation, and went on and, and worked with them. Then, uh, you know, went back to Puerto Rico and, uh, and worked in the San Juan Bay Estuary Program and the Caribbean Environment and Development uh, Institute. You know, and I always worked, I guess, in the crossroads of, of environment and, and disadvantaged communities. Uh, you know, it was uh, around at that time that a group of activists in Puerto Rico started you know, push to, to, to bring the a chapter of the Sierra Club in Puerto Rico. I, I guess I was part of that uh, generation of environmentalists. And, uh, and later on, um, you know, became very active. Back then, uh, there was a, a, a mistake in one of the practices of the U.S. Navy and, uh, and uh, where uh, a security guard got, uh, was killed, a civilian. And, um, and the, that spur, uh, 
basically was a catalyst to this big movement uh, in uh, to to drive the navy out of Vieques, and so I was uh, I was uh, able to be part of that movement, and uh, and I um, I was able to uh, well, I mean, I was arrested at the time, uh, and um, and uh, but it became a, a growing movement, and more people got arrested, and and uh, I guess I, that was my coming of age. It, you know, especially working with the community in Vieques that had suffered for so many decades of, uh, of uh, you know, bombing by the U.S. Navy. And so after that, you know, went back to, to school uh, to get skills and, uh, and uh, develop my career, you know, in, 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 uh, in environmentalism. And I thought, you know, my, my first job after that was in Environmental Defense Fund. And I thought, you know, well, I was going to be this environmentalist going to, I don't know, the, the Amazons and working on, on sexy environmentalist uh, topics. And the first thing that I, that I, was, uh, that I was assigned to was to uh, work on solid waste issues in New York City. And that was uh, an extremely uh, important uh, issue that actually shaped uh, a whole election. And, uh, and a lot of the environmental platform of the of uh, Michael Bloomberg that uh, became uh, mayor for three terms. And, uh, and so, you know, because at that time after Giuliani that still around can believe that uh, working on, on, on policy issues or really bad policies uh, it, that um, he had closed the, uh, the landfill uh, and uh, the most affected people after that were the South Bronx and uh, and Northern Brooklyn, where all these uh, communities of color, especially and disadvantaged communities, suffer from these mushroomings of of uh, solid waste transfer station. Anyway, so I worked a lot on that issue, and uh, after that, you know, very, worked very closely with the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance and the We Act for Environmental Justice, uh, an organization in West Harlem, and so on. And so that that provided me a lot of the. I guess the the framework and the sensitivity to work on these issues. So just to follow up, um, how do you sort of see this formation kind of informing the way that you're thinking about the work that you're going to be doing for the next few years? And maybe maybe thinking about that sort of post COVID. So. Um, so you mean that this formation in terms of of my. Um, um of the the jobs the career that i have developed well i think the most interesting part to me is the the kind of intersection as you describe it between um you know working on behalf of disempowered communities for racial and environmental justice um in relation to the kind of environmental piece right so so you've been thinking for a long time at the intersection of racial justice and environmental justice and i'm just curious about your vision about that where the Sierra Club can take that, so. Mm -hmm. um, well, the, um, I mean, it's a, it's, a long, it's a long process, of course. And, uh, you know, if you have, uh, uh, for example, I mean, if you have seen the, uh, the report like Green, uh, Green 2.0, or, uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, of material in, in the, that intersection that it's not the, the very uh, common or very regular one uh, that you see in the mainstream environmental uh, organizations. But, uh, you know, for if you take, you know, the Sierra Club has been around for 128 years. Uh, and, um, and the first uh, part of the Sierra Club focused a lot on conservation and, and establishing a lot of the, of the, uh, um, a history, you know, all the uh, landscapes and natural uh, protected areas that we have in the country. Now, later on, uh, I would say, especially uh, with all the, in the post uh, World War II world where there was so many, um, so much pollution happening. And, you know, if you think of the 50s, 60s uh, into the 70s, uh, then it marked the environmental movement to become much more uh, about that. And, the, and so the modern environmental movement uh, after the first Earth Day, so basically the last 50 years, um, that's when many of, of these organizations uh, um, started, you know, the NRDC, uh, um, 
Environmental Defense Fund, uh, Greenpeace, etc. And so, um, and Sierra Club, of course, was part of that. And um, but you know, it was all in all, these organizations focused a lot on the typical green issues, and uh, or were uh, cities or uh, places around the nation that were affected but that had political power or political clout, um, um, they were focusing in there. And so it is really um, later on in the 90s that many of the communities that were being affected start claiming uh, this to the, to the main environmental organizations. And so, you know, in, in 1991, a lot of them sent a letter to uh, the Sierra Club and the mainstream organizations uh, basically, you know, claiming, uh, you know, that you cannot do this without us, you know, and, uh, and that's when uh, President Clinton, um, you know, uh, signed this uh, executive order uh, on environmental justice, but things didn't like change overnight, no? Um, the, uh, you know, in 2000s, for example, a big there was a big push to deal with climate change and the, the McCain-Lieberman bill, uh, for example, that focused on market mechanisms and cap and trade. And uh, the big environmental organizations basically asked the, the environmental justice ones, uh, uh, you know, come with us, like, uh, let's push for this. And, and the environmental justice community was like, well, you know, what happens? We reduce emissions nationwide and still you're issuing uh, permits to, that will affect our communities, uh, you know, so uh, that is not good. And they learn from from those mistakes of of trusting uh, these uh, mainstream organizations, and uh, and then uh, you know claiming for uh, uh, for space, but also for funding for uh, assistance. And uh, and I mean, I could go on for a while, but uh, you know, the Sierra Club has been a a, a long journey uh, to be much more conscious of, of, of its size, but also, uh, you know, of, uh, of how we um, collaborate or how we partner uh, with, uh, with our, our, these organizations. And so, uh, for example, a group of, the, I mean, the same group of organizations, uh, you know, came up in the late 90s with the HEMES principles uh, for democratic organizing. And, um, and that the Sierra Club finally, you know, uh, adopted, uh, you know, decades later. Uh, but, uh, and quite recently, I think it was 2014 uh, that we adopted as our methodology to engage, you know, and that's a, a methodology to, to engage in mutuality where you're asked to, uh, to come and, and help and partner. It's based on mutuality, you know, and, and so, those things are, are very important. And, uh, you know, to finish with that topic, I, I would say that, uh, you know, like, for example, the Green Group, which was the, the 25 or so main uh, largest environmental organizations, and for many, for many years acted as a block, uh, you know, basically that, that group is pretty much now dissolved or transitioned into a, a new a group that it's called the Equitable and Just National Climate Platform, that it is not only the main environmental groups uh, with the big coffers and, you know, uh, that are leading the way, but joining forces with all these organizations and following the lead of environmental justice leaders like Peggy Shepard, for example, who is now co-chairing the, the White House EJ uh, um, uh, advisory group. Uh, with Richard Moore from New Mexico that was one of these conveners of the Hemis principles or Cecilia Martinez who is now heading the new office uh, of the in the White House focusing on environmental justice and the Justice 40 initiative of the Biden administration so it's very exciting to see all these uh, people that for many years have uh, uh, basically asked and and request and and have struggled for so long to have a space in this finally taking the center stage and be able to uh, uh, dictate policy and uh, help in the decision making. That's terrific. Thank you for um, for that, Ramon. Um, so let me ask you a little bit. Um, I'm going to kind of 
skip down to um, a, another question because I think you answered um, a question that I was going to ask you about the kind of diversification of, of um, mainstream environmentalism. But I want to ask a little bit about um, the blog post, Pulling Down Our Monuments, that came out last year. And uh, this got a lot of attention, as you know. Um, I, I taught this piece earlier this year in a class that I'm, I'm offering right now at AU. And the students were really animated about the conversation um, and particularly about the comment section, which was um, quite controversial, as you know. Um, so I'm curious about some of the claims that this piece makes. In the, in the piece, um, the blog post promises to make the Sierra Club an anti-racist organization, not just to kind of reckon with the racist history of mainstream environmentalism, but to specifically make the organization a, an anti-racist group. So I'm curious about just two things. Um, how are you doing towards making progress on this goal? And secondly, um, what, what is the Sierra Club doing to make sure that these goals become institutionalized, not just within the Sierra Club, but you know, sort of in terms of the broader kind of green equity movement that you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, thanks for that question, uh, David. Um, you know, in terms of how we are doing, I mean, I would say, in, in short, you know, it's too fast and too deep as many would like and too slow and too superficial as others uh, would prefer. Uh, you know, so, uh, so I, I, I remember uh, Mike Soto from, from the Center for the New Economy in Puerto Rico once told me that, you know, when, you're, when you have the opportunity to affect change, when people from all sides are, are criticizing what you're doing, and so uh, there are many changes uh, happening, uh, and these changes often lead to crisis, you know, and it's a, a moment of change, certainly, where we are, especially after the summer of reckoning. Um, you know, I think no institution in the U.S. was uh, spared from that. And, um, and so we have, I, I guess I would answer your question in, you know, twofold, one internally and also externally so internally you know the the we took especially after last summer it, you know there has been a, a a movement towards uh more equity and justice and centering everything we do in in uh equity and justice but you know especially after last summer we changed the management structure created an interim executive uh steering committee that has a majority BIPOC, no black, indigenous, and people of color, um, and uh, and that deals with the with big picture issues of the organization, culture, mission, uh, etc. And um, and also we dedicated a portion of the funds to deal with uh, issues of systemic racism within the organization, and also in terms of uh, you know conflict resolution, creating affinity groups or racially based affinity groups, and. Uh, and, um, and also ensuring that staff have resources to deal with the consequences of, of all this uh, pervasive culture in the US, no? Uh, we're revising, we have been working on a multi-year equity plan that was in its first phase of implementation. And so, you know, there are many things that we're dealing with in terms of how we advance uh, people, how we advance, especially people of color, how we evaluate and ensure also that people have the tools to succeed. And um, I think another, then if we switch more externally, is uh, following the HEMES principles, the uh, Equitable and Just uh, National Climate Platform, you know? So it's how learning how to be better partners, uh, helping also the philanthropic community to share the funding, uh, you know, that um, uh, with also other groups that are perhaps uh, less, uh, uh, recognizable by by name uh, and by size, but that impacts are uh, very very important. No, and so um, so of course that will take some adjustments uh, to deal with. But uh, but we're in that process, and I think it's a journey that most organizations uh, and institutions in the U.S. are are going through. So can I ask just a quick follow up on that? Um, I'm, I'm curious about how you're responding um, either individually or in terms of this sort of internal steering committee to some of the specific criticism that you've received um, 
from maybe some older guard membership who want to resist um, the kind of mm -hmm. equity moves that you're that you're making. Yeah. Um, well, you know, when um, I, I guess when we started that whole process of uh, publicly re-examining aspects of of the difficult past of the of the Sierra Club, you know, including you know reckoning with uh, with the history and and the words of our founder John Muir that you know of course it's a uh, in environmentalism is like a like a sacred figure, and you know many of the responses we have received were very uh, to that blog post that uh, that you were mentioning before, um, you know there was a lot of positive uh, responses, uh, you know, embracing our move to ground the environmental movement in equity and justice, but others, you know, were more skeptical and were urging, you know, to stay in, in our lane, you know, uh, and stick to protecting the environment. And a few responses uh, also that we got, uh, you know, it's, definitely less charitable you know ranging from calling our efforts reverse discrimination to to language you know that could be taken out of a of a hate group uh you know playbook you know so uh it, back then in an op-ed in the in the san francisco chronicle i was uh, i addressed especially you know the stay in in your lane kind of group that was uh uh, you know, where many members and supporters of the Sierra Club for many years were. And, you know, we have nearly 4 million members. And and there, you know, I told them that, you know, I guess I cannot help but stay in my lane, you know, that I, I want to share that road of uh, environmental advocacy with, with them. And I, I want them to understand why it is so important that the Sierra Club's lane is in the environmental movement be broad enough to include people like me you know uh, I, I come from a from a colonized place uh, you know where people are often discriminated against and uh, where we're robbed of agency you know and I'm, I'm, I'm Puerto Rican I'm, I'm Latinx and I'm, I'm but I'm also American you know and, and Puerto Ricans didn't have a choice there uh, you know I have four uncles who fought in the in the US uh, for the US in the Korean War in a war that was not ours you know one of them died in battle you know and and so many families like mine were able to thrive in this country thanks to access to opportunity education and and privilege as well you no know? and if if not for for what some dare to call you know, reverse discrimination. I, I had the privilege to grow to go to grad school as part of a an affirmative action program, and I'm proudly and unapologetically, uh, you know, the result of affirmative action programs. And and these programs, it's unfortunate that they don't exist today. And as many result, many students do not have you know receive access to to the education that that they deserve or that they could to to start on an equal footing with other people. You know, so, but, you know, when thinking of, of all these, you know, if I think on my own history, you know, that before 1967, you know, my parents would not have been able to get married in several states, you know, because one is black and the other one is white. Uh, and, and those restrictions may seem absurd today, uh, but many were complacent, you know, with, with that, you know, and, and perhaps they thought back then that they were staying in their lane. You know, and at that time, Sierra Club uh, Lane excluded black people like, you know, my father or grandfather for a membership, not, not formally, but because it was an invitation only club and no black people were invited, you know, within that generation, black people were actually owned by one of our founders, by Joseph Leconte. So, you know, things are very different today. And, and thanks in large part to the people of color and white allies who fought and opened the doors of organizations like the Sierra Club, uh, you know, that that was able to, to happen, you know? And of course that didn't end discrimination, uh, you know, and I have seen that in the environmental movement, you know? For many years, I was always the darkest person in the room with the one with the cute Spanish accent, you know, who, who speaks funny. And, uh, and, and even though I can communicate in four languages, uh, you know, English is not my native tongue. So, so you're always conscious about these things that play, uh, you know, 
in the way that you interact with others, you know, in the spaces that you start uh, populating. And it's not only when there's other people like you that you start feeling also the, the confidence of, of that or, you know, and, uh, and so, it, you know, most, most people of color and, and women would, would probably understand this you know what I mean, you know, it's, uh, I wonder, you know, how many white men can, can grasp, you know, the, the full depth of, of this kind of situation and this kind of feelings, you know, so, so that's why we urgently need a critical, you know, reevaluation of our organization's history, you know, because it's basically a, a crucial first step to making people like me feel welcome. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a beginning to ensuring that, that people like me can join the Sierra Club and can even uh, become its president, you know? So, so you know, and going back to John Muir, like, you know, while I admire many things that John Muir wrote, you know, they're not perfect heroes in the same way that they're not perfect humans. And, uh, and so instead of focusing on that, you know, I think it's much more important, uh, you know, to focus on, on our, um, on our vision and our mission right now. And, and when asked about staying in my lane, I, I, I then respond, you know, that the only lane that I can be is, is one that recognizes and celebrates all my, my identities, you know, and that, so I hope the Sierra Club supporters and the people within the environmental movement, uh, you know, concerned about whether we focus on a narrow definition of environment can find a way to broaden that, that idea and to expand that lane, a lane that is inclusive, that, you know, comes to terms with, with the past, that celebrates diversity, that fights racism, and that centers equity and justice in everything we do. That's really terrific. Thank you uh, for that, Ramon. And uh, just to sort of uh, back you up on that, I am also a product of affirmative action programs and a proud member of the Puerto Rican uh, diaspora. So. Uh, you know, for what that's worth, I, I'm with you. Um, maybe we should just have one more question uh, because I am looking at the, ta at the time and I wanna make sure that we have plenty of time for um, audience participation. I see that the Q&A is starting to accumulate a few questions, but um, I wanna end on a positive note today. And I wanna really um, emphasize, you know, I've, one of the things I've been working on with my students this term is just constantly sort of beating the drum of hope and positivity. And I think that you know, these are difficult times. Uh, we face multiple crises. Um, you've alluded to our climate crisis and our, our racial crisis in the United States, but um, I wanna also point to um, the possibilities for hope and, and the kinds of things that we can look forward to and the kinds of things that, um, that we see as um, you know, points of light that we can, that we can orient ourselves around. So I'm curious if you could talk just a little bit about where you see hope and what challenges of the past several years, uh, given, given these challenges, uh, what continues to get you out of bed in the morning to fight the good fight? Um, well, thanks, uh, thanks, David, for that question. Um, I mean, I think, you know, especially after that summer of, of reckoning, you know, and understanding that uh, you know the intersectionality of all these issues is is a is a big hope because now it's not only the people with power uh, or the nice neighborhoods that should be the ones uh, doing this. You know, if the climate crisis we have gotten here because we're relying on, um, you know, what what my my colleague Hop Hopkins would would call the sacrifice zones. You know that uh, that you know it's. Uh, for the betterment of society, we're able to uh, pollute certain areas. You know, we're able to extract uh, fossil fuels uh, for the to to engine our economies. You know, and uh, and so all these areas where we're doing that, you know, where we're doing fracking and and polluting all watersheds, uh, you know, they become a, a sacrifice zones, and the people within there then are. A, you know, thought of as disposable, and and one cannot solve, you know, um, the this crisis, and one cannot think of people that are disposable if we are not relying on a on a an ideology of supremacy, 
the case of the U.S. in white supremacy and an ideology of racism. So that's why, you know, we cannot then face this crisis unless we also face uh, racism. And so, and so that notion that it's becoming much more widespread gives me definitely a lot of hope. Then the new generation, you know, it's amazing how, uh, you know, in the times of, uh, of all the strikers, you know, and the, I mean, now everybody, a lot of people are, are uh, uh, going uh, online for their education with the COVID crisis. But, you know, before it was beautiful to see all these, uh, the new generation, no, they're so clear. So um, uh, there's no doubt if it's science or not, or what, you know, they know what's happening. They're also threatened by it and they're taking, uh, they taking steps towards it. And finally, you know, it's just after the, the, the four most uh, uh, horrible years uh, for the world and for environment, um, you know, of the Trump administration and so many dismantling five decades of uh, environmental regulatory frameworks, etc. cetera. Uh, you know, now we see a Biden administration that has came forward with the most aggressive uh, climate platform uh, in the history of any candidate, you know, of course, you know, taking from other candidates uh, to build that. And now we're having, you know, right away, you know, all the executive orders that build back better, the announcement just two weeks ago on, uh, you know, on all this uh, uh, infrastructure, but everything centered in equity and justice. And that actually, it's a huge difference. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's if I were, you know, a lot of the students coming up now, very exciting time to be working on these issues. And that's where the future is. And hopefully the future is, uh, is diverse, is, is, is female, and it speaks uh, different languages. That's a wonderful, wonderful place to um, stop our portion of the conversation, Ramon. But I wanna open it up now to the audience. And we have a number of questions in the Q&A. So let me um, ask one of these. This is from George. Um, and he asks, uh, land in particular is so deeply tied to American white supremacy the concept of terra nullis, nobody's land, hacienda, reservation and segregation systems and the industrial devastation of the American environment are a few examples. How has land influenced your research worldviews on racism in the Western hemisphere? Kind of a big question, um, but you can take any part of that. So, so it would be, I wasn't, I wasn't uh, reading, but it's basically how has land, uh, I guess it's part of this, uh, of this, uh, I mean, of the issues that we're talking about, no? And wow, where to start with that? Because of course, I mean, for uh, especially indigenous uh, um, tribal nations, you know, it's, uh, it's the issue goes as, as uh, soon as uh, many uh, European settlers uh, started eyeing this, uh, this nation, no? And it has continued. And, uh, and so there are, I mean, when it comes to um, many of the issues that I have worked on in, in, in my career in terms of transportation, energy, utilities, where, where are things uh, settled? And again, all these, the concept of land is very much attached to uh, the concept of sacrifice zones and, uh, and where we, um, where do we uh, place all those facilities that are uh, essential to our, the way we live right now, the way we consume. And so we're in a way going backwards in terms of, uh, of not using uh, wisely our uh, resources. And so, um, and so I, I, yeah, I guess it's very much interlinked uh, with that. And um, yeah. I guess I'll, I'll stop there knowing that this, we could have a whole course on that question. So thanks a lot, George. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so next question um, is from another uh, AU alumna, Diana, who asks, um, many of the mid and large size mainstream greens, NRDC, EDF, et cetera, are continuing to advance carbon capture, cap and trade, valuation of natural resources, such as water, land, et cetera. 
Fundamentally, that is very at odds with indigenous sovereignty and black liberation movements in the global south. Obviously, communities across Latin America, et cetera, as well. There are conversations with philanthropic communities to perhaps direct more funding to Global South versus US focused green groups as they traditionally receive the least amount of money but are hurting the worst. And she cites the example of Puerto Rico and Honduras for, uh, for examples. Yet there remains much concern by mainstream greens. How does the Sierra Club work or partner with Global South movements, especially since they prioritize centering black and indigenous lives and advanced food sovereignty, climate justice approaches, et cetera? Um, well, also uh, uh, a question uh, that, uh, that would merit a, a whole course. Uh, so thanks a lot, Diana. But uh, I, you know, it's in terms of the Sierra Club, our focus has been the United States. And so, and so in, that, in that way, um, you know, right now, everything we have done, it's, it's mostly focusing there with some international aspects in terms of where the U.S. can, um, can have um, some a kind of, um, a, you know, authority or jurisdiction, you know, say like the, the Paris Agreement or, a, you know, the Sustainable Development Goals and different things where the U.S. can actually um, effect there but that's because that's our mission that doesn't mean that we cannot be solidaire with uh, with movements in the global south also uh, let's remember that that same dynamic that happens in the geopolitical uh, you know in the geopolitics of the world uh, happens also internally in every city in every you know microcosm because there are um, you know issues of, of justice or injustices in, uh, in, in, all, in all cities right now. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it is not that, uh, that we are not uh, focusing on that. Other organizations have a mandate of working more internationally. So I'm not trying again to justify why we're not, I mean, or I'm trying to justify and explain why we're not uh, involved in international issues that are very, uh, very relevant and very important to you know to what Diana is is alluding to, uh, but again here in the U.S. we have uh, we suffered that same dynamic, especially with uh, disadvantaged communities, and so so that's why it's so important and, and and I'm hopeful that many of these leaders are now taking positions decision making positions in the Biden administration, because it is not the same. Uh, when you have these people then uh, and these leaders at the table, uh, you know, it's not necessarily that, well, all uh, market mechanisms and cap and trade, et cetera, uh, are evil. It's just the implementation and because of the nature of the mechanism, then you leave it up to it. It, it basically uh, means for many people, no government intervention. And we have seen over and over that if you leave it up to the market, and if you leave it up to capitalism, things are not going to go well for people that have no power, no resources. Uh, and so it is important for those uh, for for uh, those in power to be intervening where things are not going well. And so that's why I think it's it's different uh, now. And I hope you know in uh, in all these uh, in governments you know beyond the U.S the more you can uh, have strong institutions and with the more you have uh, leaders that are, um, that are uh, in positions of uh, that, you know, that are in new positions of power that, that you can see some of that change, you know, and that becomes, that comes when it becomes much more democratic when there's more a uh, woman in that uh, in that leadership, and when there's more uh, a, a diversity of of uh, people. Terrific! Thank you so much. Okay, so Amanda asks, um, what concrete results have the Sierra Club been able to accomplish, i.e., policy influence projects in marginalized communities or within the environmental justice movement during the past five years, and especially during the last year in 2020. Well, I, I think the most uh, important part is um, is uh, reckoning with with 
what role we can play, you know, because in a way, not because all of a sudden is, is the Sierra Club is, is led by uh, Latinx or have more people of color in their leadership means that we are an environmental justice organization. We are not, you know, and we are a national uh, environmental organizations that have uh, 64 chapters that have the ability to go to the grassroots, uh, but we are aware of our size. And uh, we have had very successful national campaigns like Beyond Coal that has uh, been, um, you can attribute a big part of the closure of, uh, of uh, coal plants around the US to that campaign. However, it is only when you partner and when you collaborate with local groups uh, that you do that. So if you ask me, you know, what is a big accomplishment? It's uh, coming to terms with, uh, with our size and being able to then uh, be able to share resources with other organizations as well. That's great, thank you so much. Okay, we have a question from um, a student at American University, and this student asks, what advice would you give to students of color who, are, who after graduating plan to enter fields that are not very diverse? How can we work at an individual level to combat systemic racism and inequality? Mm -hmm. um, well, great, great question. Um, just to finalize something also in the last question, something that I, that I think I should have included as well is that we are at a moment, um, you know, in terms of the, of the Sierra Club, uh, that, you know, there are many things that we gain, but also very important to know that it's not only us, that it's really the collaboration with many others. So if I say, for example, uh, being able to uh, have uh, most bank, uh, banks uh, or financial institutions uh, pledging not to... Uh, and not to um, invest in companies that were willing to drill in the Arctic, uh, and, you know, and in the in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, that was a big, uh, you know, uh, a big gain. But was by no means the Sierra Club it, uh, in its own. There's a whole Guichin, uh, you know, steering committee that uh, that basically partner with many organizations like ours. Now, in terms of, and I know that. Uh, time is is uh, close, you know. In terms of of um, you know advice to to people of color, you know, it's uh, I mean the world is is changing uh, again, not as fast as many of us would like, uh, but definitely not the same as uh, as the um, you know I guess you know when I was uh, at AU, you know, and uh, and so I mean it's always important to you know, to look for uh, mentors and, uh, and mm -hmm. for uh, people that would uh, basically, um, that would help you advance yourselves. But uh, often, you know, it's uh, don't feel, don't feel embarrassed to ask for help and to ask for, um, you know, to, to claim that space that should be ours and should be everyone's. You know, again, in many places, because of, of say, my accent or my uh, thinking in Spanish or things like that, I know that I'm not in the, I, I didn't have the same starting point as somebody, you know, the, uh, that had the privilege, you know. Uh, when I went to grad school, uh, you know, there were four generations that have been to that same Ivy League, you know, and, uh, and, uh, in the meantime, you know, that probably four generations ago, I had slaves in my family. And so, you know, we didn't have the same starting points. And we have to uh, be sure that we don't feel bad on claiming the, the spaces that, that are ours. And hopefully we have, we will increasingly have a world that, um, that is opening up to, uh, to more uh, diversity and more people like us and, and a society that, uh, you know, and, and a movement that reflects a society. It's like, you know, it was beautiful to see Biden's cabinet, uh, you know, in the, in, when that first picture was taken and half of the cabinet is female. And there's so many uh, people of color in that cabinet and it's a, a cabinet that reflects the society that we live in. So, you know, if I were starting right now, wow, like 
entering, you know, and hearing many of you are in DC that are listening to this, you know, entering and being the having the opportunity of contribute to society in that in in that way in the, the changes that we're going to foresee in the upcoming years is is very important and then organize communities because you know it's also very scary that half of the population like voted for or a big chunk of the population voted for for Trump you know voters uh, and uh, and so there's a lot of work to do and so it is people that looks uh, like us uh, that can actually uh, make a big difference, mobilize communities and ensure that we have a, a future that, uh, that involves us, that includes us because otherwise uh, uh, nobody was going to do it for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a really um, terrific point, um, Ramon. And I think a really good place to kind of um, cut off the Q&A for today um, to end on a really positive note, but to kind of further that positive feeling, I wanna read a, um, a comment from Christina who says, thank you, Ramon, feeling encouraged. And uh, if, if nothing else, I hope that people will feel encouraged and, uh, and, and energized by the conversation that we had today. Um, if I could, I would like to just respond very quickly to Elizabeth who asks for some resources on gathering data on the intersection of race, ethnicity, and environment. And um, I can offer some very quick sources. There are wonderful books by people like Sarah Wald, um, David, Par David Pello and um, Lisa Sunhee Park, Julie Z, that's S-Z-E, -S um, Robert Bullard, who is one of the founders of environmental justice, Laura Pulido, another uh, foundational thinker. And if I could be so bold to recommend um, a book that I've been involved with, um, Latinx Environmentalisms, which came out in 2019, is another really terrific source. And if you're interested, Elizabeth, you can uh, email me and be in conversation. And Ramon, if you want to add to that list, please go right ahead. Um, well, look for the resources that are happening right now. The you know under the Equitable and Just Environmental uh, National um, Climate Platform. Uh, you know where yeah, Bob Bullard is is one of those people that are inspiring that that movement. And then uh, there's something called the Green, Green Leadership Trust. Uh, that many of us in uh, in the leadership of environmental organizations are part of. Uh, that's where the Green 2.0 also, um, you know, is part of that. Uh, and uh, looking for, I mean, there's a lot of resources as part of uh, Green 2.0. Uh, but uh, but yeah, there's a, it's a, it's a field that is thriving right now, and um, there's a lot of resources that are going to be out there and. and uh, and ways to contribute, so. That's terrific, and uh, just to let everybody know, if you're interested in reading the Green 2.0 report, it's available for free on the internet. You just Google Green 2.0 and you'll get a PDF that comes up. So I want to take um, another moment just to thank Ramon Cruz again for being in conversation today and joining us again at AU. I hope that we can do it again soon and, and do it face-to-face. -face. That would be quite lovely. Um, I wanna also give a shout out to the organizers and, uh, and to the, the folks who helped to pay for this event. Um, and I wanna give a kind of preview for the next event. So we hope that you'll be able to attend the next SIS Earth Day event. And um, there's going to be a slide that should pop up momentarily. Thank you everyone for attending today for all the wonderful questions. Uh, we're really grateful to all of you for spending an hour with us and um, uh, come to the next event. So thanks everyone. Thank you.